My name is Kate Paisani and I work at Carla and we're very grateful that you decided to join us today for our last presentation of the spring 2022 semester. So we are thrilled today to have Vivian Franco Diaz here with us. Vivian is a PhD candidate in Hispanic linguistics in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies here at the University of Minnesota. Um, and she is going to be talking to us today about the effects of guided strategic planning on intermediate and advanced heritage, Spanish heritage speakers, written complexity, accuracy, and fluency. So welcome Vivian, thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. I appreciate it. So welcome everybody to my presentation and I'm going to get started with some definitions. I'm going to uh, define guided strategic planning in second language learning and teaching. So strategic planning is a subcategory of pre-tax planning. And this means when learners have the opportunity to plan before they carry out a, a task. So uh, strategic planning can be guided or unguided. For my study, I decided to incorporate a guided strategic planning and this means that learners receive instructions about what and how to plan. For example, being advised on, for example, to focus on grammar, vocabulary, content, organization. Um, Ellis, uh, who is one of the researchers uh, very well known for uh, the topic of tax and pre-tax planning, uh, it states that pre-tax planning contributes to the conceptualization of message content while also assisting control, processing, and selective attention to form. So what do we know about pre-tax planning in a second language? So what we know is that most of the research focus on oral tasks. Um, and most of them uh, are the studies of English as a foreign language, um, they are based on oral narrative tasks and the planning time that they uh, provide is 10 minutes to write in English their planning. Um, and also um, some of the results, most of the result, results suggest a strong effects on complexity and fluency, but not significant effects on accuracy as for example, the study by Crocs, 1989. And most of these studies don't manipulate uh, proficiency as a variable. So um, a study that differs a little bit from previous studies uh, is the one by Yuan and Ellis, 2003, who um, find that pre-tax planners were not more fluent or accurate than planners. And this study is a uh, comparison with different types of planning. And um, a study that um, incorporates uh, different proficiency levels is uh, the one by Kagauchi, 2005, and they, uh, she found uh, gains depending on proficiency. For example, advanced group did not always produce uh, best performance in the plan tax, and higher intermediate group benefited the most from planning in fluency and complexity, while the lower intermediate benefited the most of it in accuracy. So this is only like one of the few researchers um, that actually uh, manipulate proficiency as a variable in these kind of uh, studies. What do we know about pre-tax planning on second language writing? Um, we, um, according to Ellis 2021, systematic review of 32 experimental studies, the conclusions are the following. Uh, there is no clear evidence that pre-tax planning leads to a better overall writing quality when this is measured using rating rubrics. Pre-tax planning generally results in more fluent writing. Pre-tax planning impact on lexical and, uh, lexical and syntactic complexity is inconsistent and significant. Collaborative as opposed to individual planning can lead to increased accuracy. 
Uh, some, some examples of the studies about uh, the effects of pre-tax planning on second language writing uh, is, for example, the one by Ellis and Juan, 2004, who analyzed 42 texts um, from written by English uh, foreign language learners. Uh, this study also examines different types of planning, but I focus on the uh, pre-tax planning uh, for this presentation. And they also um, analyze their writing in terms of written narrative text. So the pre-tax planning was 10 minutes. Uh, there was no detailed guidance um, on what to do, but the participants were asked to plan in terms of content, organization, and language. Participants were told not to write the whole story, and notes were taken away before they started the task. The main writing task, um, it was a narration related to a set of pictures. They had to write uh, this in 17 minutes and write 200 words. The results of this study um, suggest that pretax planning has positive effects on fluency, a relatively strong effect on complexity, specifically variety of verb forms, but not effect on lexical variety. And pretax planning has very little effect on accuracy. Another example of this type of study is the study by C.J.D. et al. 2013, who analyzes uh, 15 texts um, from uh, English foreign language learners. Um, and there was a group of pretext planning and a group of uh, without pretext planning. They also wrote um, narrative text. And the pretext planning, as previous studies, was 10 minutes. There was no detailed guidance, and the students were advised to take notes before the task. Uh, the writing task was um, similar to previous studies, a narration related to a set of pictures. And uh, a difference from the other studies is that there was no pressure in terms of time and number of words for them. The results are the following. Pre-tax planning has positive effects on lexical complexity and fluency, but not effects on accuracy. Now, what do we know about the use of planning in a Spanish heritage uh, students' writing? So there is not much of what we know, very, very little research about this. Uh, there is a study by Swartz, 2003, who studies um, the the strategic planning when writing a descriptive writing task. And her participants were three, uh, Micaela, Joanna, y Rosaura, on Ros Ros Rosaura. And they were enrolled in a Spanish for, Herit for, Hispani for native speakers. So um, the data of the planning time performance was gathered through Think Aloud protocols while they were writing the, the essay or the writing task. So the results for this uh, study uh, are that there was a great vari variability in the students use of planning as a writing strategy. Uh, for example, Micaela used it as a pre-writing strategy. For example, she spent four minutes and a half brainstorming possible topics in English and then Joanna and Rosaura use planning as a composing strategy. So Joanna started uh, writing immediately. And then after the first sentence, she stopped to brainstorm for two minutes. And then Rosaura only stopped to write five topics in the margin after she had written already three paragraphs. And she consulted the list later in her essay and crossed out the topics she had uh, addressed. Uh, the results also suggest um, that uh, uh, the participants abandon text when not able to say what they wanted to say in Spanish, even though they use planning in a diversity manner. And there were also some constraints for lack of vocabulary. They were uh, very frustrated for not knowing how to say something. 
and uh, also frustrated, frustrated uh, trying to translate from English to Spanish since um, they expressed that when they were trying to write down in Spanish, they were thinking in English. So the motivation for my study, what are my own motivations? Fill the gaps of previous research by studying the written linguistic performance of a relatively understudied group of individuals, in this case, Spanish heritage speakers, in the pretext planning research base that has only focused on second language learner, learners and oral performance, and also expand on previous literature methodologies by including different levels of language proficiency, and also introducing a more, a more inclusive analysis of Spanish heritage speakers written accuracy. Likewise, uh, provide some insights on the design of educational materials for the development of heritage writing skills. So my research questions are the following. What are the effects of guided strategic planning on intermediate and advanced Spanish heritage speakers written complexity, accuracy, and fluency? What is the interaction between a strategic planning and language proficiency level on the participants' written productions? Uh, my participants were 22 Spanish heritage speakers, and this data comes from a larger study in which I also analyze uh, more participants and I incorporate other, other variables such as tax complexity. Um, I define heritage speakers as the children of first generation Hispanic immigrants who have lived most of their lives in the United States, grew up in a home where the Spanish was one of the main languages of communication, have an early connection to the heritage language, and their understanding of Spanish may vary according to the linguistic experiences they have had. They also may or may not be active in relearning Spanish, for example, enrolled in heritage language classes. Um, for demographic information, I use a 10 minute background questionnaire. And according to this questionnaire, their ages were uh, between 18 to 28 years old. Their Hispanic background was from North and Central and South America. And 14 of them were born in the US and eight of them uh, came to the US when they were mon nine months old to four years old. Um, to determine the proficiency level, I use the proficiency test, uh, test uh, modified version of the DELE by Montreux. And uh, the results were that uh, the participants, 10 of them, were intermediate at the intermediate level and 12 at the advanced level. For the um, language dominance, to determine their language dominance, I use the bilingual language profile, BLP which is a survey, survey of self-report. So the scores uh, here ranges from minus 218 to plus 218. And a score uh, near zero indicates balance bilingualism and more positive or more negative uh, scores reflect uh, respective language dominance. Um, what do the participants say about their writing skills? So based on the BLP, the Bilingual Language Profile, uh, the intermediate group believes uh, their skills are below average, average, while the advanced group believe that they have some skills. They, they have an average um, skill of writing in Spanish. Uh, this is the writing argumentative task that the participants had to carry out. So first I give them a context, uh, which is related to what would uh, probably can happen in the real world. And then there is a question uh, for them, which they need to answer. So I'm going to read it 
uh, a group of Hispanic students at a, uni at a U.S. university is creating a section for the university magazine about life between two languages and cultures as part of their Spanish heritage class final project. One of the members in the group is your friend and asks for your help. She is gathering personal opinions from the local communi community to include in the, in the magazine. She would like you to write your thoughts and personal opinions about the following question. Do you agree or disagree that being bilingual influences a person's identity? They have to write six reasons, 300 words in 30 minutes. The participants were randomly assigned to one of these groups with pretext planning time, which was a guided planning, a 10 minute guided planning. And I have five participants of intermediate level and seven of advanced level. And then without pretext planning, uh, which means that they didn't have any time to plan. And I had five intermediate in this group and five advanced. This is the pre-tax planning um, that the pre-tax planning group had. And uh, the purpose was to basically uh, help prepare for the writing task. So here we see that I asked the question, um, I suggest the audience, and then there is a chart where they could think about reasons, arguments, examples, evidence, think of vocabulary that they might use. Uh, think of the thesis statement, think of introduction. For example, how are you going to pull your reader into your text? Conclusion, restatement of your thesis, how, why should the audience align with your position? what needs to be done in the future to understand this topic. So participants for this pre-tax planning uh, could use Spanish, English, or both. They could use ideas of single words or sentences as preferred, and they could also use dictionaries if needed. Participants could not use translators, for the purpose of translating entire sentences and paragraphs. And also they could not use external help such as friends, family members, or the like to answer this activity. And this is because they did or they developed these activities or these tags uh, online through Qualtrics. So I was not present when they were doing this. Uh, data analysis, uh, I evaluated their written performance through uh, the parameters of complexity, accuracy, and fluency. I'm going to start with complexity. Um, I um, took into account uh, different measures to account for length, clausal subordination, and noun phrase complexity. Here are some of the examples, the formula I use for each one. And uh, I decided to have several measures or a diversity of measures also to be able to differentiate on the complexity between the intermediate and the advanced group. Previous research, uh, research has found that intermediate level will show their complexity through clausal subordination, while advanced uh, levels would show their complexity through the use of more of noun phrases or noun phrase complexity. Um, in terms of accuracy, I took into account the perspective of acceptability and relevance according to social context or a speech community, as stated by Hassan et al. and Norris and Ortega. And in my study, uh, error is defined as any deviation from the dialect variety, both formal and informal. And uh, this methodology differs from previous studies uh, because um, they, these previous studies compare the language use with monolingual standard uh, use of the language. And here I decided to 
just take into account the dialect variety, both informal and formal. The formula to evaluate accuracy was number of error-free T units divided by the number of T units, and I examined morphosyntactic aspects uh, in terms of morphology. I consider gender, number, person, verb tense, parts of the verbs, such as root and suffix. And uh, this was kind of like the analysis I developed, nominal agreement, subject verb agreement, subject predicate uh, agreement. For syntax, I considered word order, omission of words, and insertion, insertion of words. Um, finally, for fluency, I consider the fluency as participants' productivity, and this was evalu is evaluated as the number of words written in the same allocation of time for all participants. The results uh, for pre-tax planning language preference. The intermediate group uh, prefer to do their, pre their pre-tax planning in English, only one uh, participant used Spanish, and the advanced group uh, used uh, Spanish the most, three participants, and then English, two participants, and then English and Spanish, uh, two participants. Um, in terms of the participants' focus when doing the pre-tax planning, it was mainly at the discourse level. So they were focusing on the audience, on the organization, on listing reasons and examples and evidence. And the format for most of them was sentences. Some of the participants' comments for the pre-tax planning were the following. Uh, the pre-planning section was not enough time for me. I was having a hard time picking my position on whether I agree or disagree with the prompt because I do totally agree that being bilingual has an effect on someone's identity. Um, these are some examples of pre-tax planning in English for the intermediate level. So here we see... Um, the participant listing some of the reasons and evidence, and also uh, their idea for the thesis that they would want to use for their task. Uh, this is an example of English, uh, pre tax plan planning in English for the advanced level. So here, this participant answers the question post. Also, um, starts thinking of the introduction, thinking of thesis, listing some evidence, some reasons, some examples, and also thinking of how the audience should align to the, with the position and some future, um, what can be done in the future to understand this topic. These are some examples um, of pretext tax planning in Spanish. For the intermediate level, uh, this participant was looking for some ideas of hypotheses or theories to support her arguments about grammar, cognition, language, and culture. And in the case of the advanced level, the same, some listing of ideas, um, of what to say in terms of um, reasons and evidence. Um, an example of the bilingual pre-tax planning um, observed in the advanced level is the following. Um, here we see that the audience was written in English and also the reasons and evidences also in English, while the thesis was uh, fully in Spanish. And the introduction, a phrase in English. The results for complexity. So um, I found that there is not much evidence for planning time having an effect on this parameter. And there was not 
either a difference between advanced and intermediate performance. So they perform very similar um, in both conditions. For accuracy, a similar trend, not much evidence for planning time um, on accuracy. The only statistical difference was at the proficiency level in which the advanced group is more accurate than the intermediate group. And a similar trend is the same for uh, fluency. Not much evidence for planning time on fluency. The only statistical difference was at the proficiency level where advanced, the advanced group was more fluent than the intermediate group. And uh, something that we see here, for example, in accuracy is that the intermediate group seems to even have a better performance when not having uh, time to plan. The same for fluency and that even probably that uh, pre-tax planning can be of a detrimental on their performance. However, the differences uh, between those conditions were were not significant. Discussions and conclusions for this particular data. There is evidence that the availability of planning does not have an effect on intermediate and advanced Spanish heritage speakers reading performance. However, strong conclusions cannot be made due to the small sample size, which makes it difficult to determine if this is a true outcome. Therefore, more participants should be included for each condition. Likewise, um, the participants' proficiency levels are very high. It's intermediate and advanced, which may explain why pre-tax planning did not significantly affect their performance. And um, so future studies should include, for example, a lower proficiency level for comparisons. As we see, so in one of the previous studies by Elisa and Joan, um, they see more of an effect in the lower intermediate group and the higher intermediate group, but not effects in the advanced group. So probably we can find some, some data about the lower intermediate levels. Uh, during the argumentative writing task, uh, the participants had the possibility to include some uh, words uh, in English if needed, which could have also facilitated the writing process for them. And um, I suggest too that this type of studies should uh, include an adequacy analysis, which means to assess the speaker's tax fulfillment requirements to examine the quality of the written production between planners and no planners. Uh, other features of the tax, such as the number of reasons, having less or more reasons to write, should be analyzed in interaction with tax implementation, for example, planning time versus without planning time, to examine how conceptual and procedural features of the task influence the Spanish heritage speakers' written performance. And as previous research has shown, there are no conclusive results as to the effects of pre-tax planning on written complexity and accuracy. Um, therefore, more studies are needed to explore factors such as source of planning, for example, teacher-led planning, individual learner planning, and group-based planning, and also the effects of planning tax that, for example, focus specifically on form. Um, it should also be analyzed if effects of strategic planning on monolinguals productions can be compared to unique groups of bilinguals such as heritage speakers. Since previous research on first language planning suggests that when native speakers are given more time to plan, they produce less speech compared to learners. And this was a study by Foster 2001. Pedagogical implementations and implications. Uh, the kind of planning used in the present study, which is guided strategic planning, might be beneficial to lower 
proficiency levels of Spanish heritage speakers. Uh, that's something that we could explore. It was not a great effect for intermediate and advanced levels, but it might be of beneficial effect for lower proficiency levels. It is also important to discuss with our heritage students that some strategies are more beneficial than others, depending on different factors, learning styles, for example, learning goals, pedagogic tax goals, tax structure, learner's proficiency level. Consequently, the practice of different planning strategies should be incorporated to match learning styles and learning objectives of attacks, for example, focus on form versus focus on meaning versus focus on form and meaning both. Also, it's important to incorporate authentic, meaningful tags, at least at the uh, level of somewhat authentic, for example, tags that simulate what happens in the world or outside the school, or even fully authentic that are real to them, authentic to their lives that may have a direct impact or use in the real world. Why um, was it was uh, in this study, it was uh, evident that the participants were able to engage in meaningful language when doing the, the argumentative writing tasks. They were, for example, detailing anecdotes, describing emotions, using proverbs, even incorporating poetic writing styles. And there is an example of a participant here uh, where is making, for example, comparisons of what is to be uh, with the family speaking Spanish, what is to be at home uh, and speaking English and being called her name by her family and being called her name uh, at, at her job, that the feelings are not the same. And it even brings different memories. Um, so yeah, that's one of the examples. And the references, and thank you so much. And if you have questions, comments, that would be great. Thank you, Vivian. Um, it's nice to see um, the progression that your research has taken since you presented the last time. A couple, was it last year that you presented or was it two years ago? I can't remember. That was uh, last, last semester, I think. Last spring, I think it was. Uh, yeah, think la, it was oh last yeah, spring. last spring. Yeah, yeah that so. was a yeah, that was my pilot study. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's nice. To, it's nice to see the re most recent developments. So there, we do have one question in the chat from Mandy, and she asks um, if you have a sense of how faithful the participants' writing was to their pre-planning. So did you see a connection between what they what ideas that they had outlined? and what they actually wrote, or did they sort of change course once they started writing? Um, some of them used their ideas, some other ones just didn't even use them, but most of them were using their ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a related question actually, and that is whether you have analyzed your data in relation to the ideas that are being expressed and the variety of vocabulary that's being used. Um, because I think sometimes with pre-task planning, mm -hmm. some of the research that I'm familiar with shows that it helps with the content mm -hmm. of learners' productions as opposed mm -hmm. to the linguistic mm -hmm. accuracy, fluency, and complexity of their productions. So have you thought at all about that? Yeah, I was... Um... Uh, thinking of analyzing it through adequacy. Um, so if the participants uh, fulfill the requirements of the task and also more of a qualitative uh, analysis of uh, what language were they using um, for the task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of content. That's, that's for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so we invite you to ask questions in the chat. Um, I have one other question for Vivian. So while she's answering that, please do um, go ahead and ask your questions. I was really curious about um, the slide where you talked about the definition of accuracy. 
and how you how you determined whether something was an error. Mm-hmm. So I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit and um, talk about how you defined you talked about dialect variety. So an error was any deviation from the dialect variety, whether it was in, whether it was the formal variety or the informal variety. So I'm curious about how you defined those varieties and how you went about determining an error, particularly with informal varieties, which don't figure into grammar Mm -hmm. textbooks or into formal writing instruction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I wanted to be more inclusive with accuracy, uh, especially because n- like um, at least some of the students, some of the heritage speakers didn't have a formal uh, class of Spanish and they were just uh, learning their Spanish at home or with their friends. And also uh, what I did was just to take into account, for example, um, the Hispanic background that they have from their parents or themselves and search uh, literature review about those dialects and take into account what is accepted for that dialect and what is not. But I didn't want to focus on standard monolingual varieties because that's kind of like what I thought it was a disadvantage of the other previous research um, that study heritage speakers uh, performance, written performance, because I believe that uh, when they come here to this country or when they are uh, born here and growing up bilingual, uh, what they get is uh, what their parents have and what they socialize with uh, the other dialects in the US. So that was kind of like my main goals. Yep. It's a difficult task to do though, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. they're coming from different parts of the Spanish speaking world. And I'm also curious if you could talk a little bit about how you handled uh, code switching or Mm -hmm. translanguaging, if you want Mm -hmm. to call it that, Mm -hmm. in your data. Yeah, so um, previous research actually uh, don't even uh, count it as part of the, the, the analysis, but I did include it. I don't count it as an error and I analyze it as part of their speech, as part of, as part of their text or um, of the writing. So I don't ignore it or I don't consider it as wrong. Mm-hmm. I would just analyze it as, the same as I would analyze the Spanish. Because yeah, it's part of their bilingual identity. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. So there's another question now in the chat from Carol. And um, she says, one of the suggestions that you had for future research is to conduct an adequacy analysis. Could you talk a bit more about what that would involve and how it might potentially affect the results? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Mm, because most of the participants focus on like content um, and this is what uh, pre-tax planning research has also found, then I thought adequacy might uh, provide some insights on, for example, uh, planners maybe more, more, maybe have more uh, quality of, um, of a text than the non-planners, for example. And then uh, I had an adequacy rubric, uh, which is uh, adapt- adapted from the TOEFL, and it's just considering uh, if, it meet- if the participant meets the expectations or not, depending on uh, content, uh, organization, vocabulary, accuracy. So Mohammed asks a follow-up question about whether there are specific tools Mm -hmm. that you would use to conduct that analysis. Tools would be a rubric uh, for adequacy. So it's uh, a rubric. I I already created the rubric. It's a rubric uh, based or adapted from from the app form. So... Uh, it would be reading the text and classifying it depending on uh, this course, if it, the participant meets the expectation or approaches 
the expectations. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the main tool would be a, a rubric. Mm -hmm. And then that rubric would, would have content, vocabulary, organization, and accuracy or language. Mm -hmm. So I think that covers all the questions that came up from the audience. So we want to thank everybody for coming today. And we especially want to thank Vivian for sharing this research. It's so like I said, it's just so nice to see your progress with your dissertation. And we look forward to hearing news about more progress as you mm -hmm. move forward with your analyses. And thanks all for coming. This is the last of our Carla talks for the semester. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in fall 2022. Take good care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.